understand that the description of the crucifixion in the ancient Hebrew writings takes place before crucifixion was even implemented as a method of torture and death by the Romans. When David wrote Psalm 22, crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet, hadn't even been thought of. It would have been considered inhumane in the ancient Middle East. And yet the Roman government decides this is one way when you've conquered a country to subjugate these people and keep them under authority, crucify as many as you have to, terrorize the population into submission. The actual term crucifixion is not used in the Old Testament. However, there are several ancient references that clearly indicate it was the means of capital punishment by which the Messiah would die. As a result, the fulfillment of messianic prophecy hinged upon a specific historical chronology. The Messiah has to come during the period of the Roman Empire. It's only in that narrow window of time when the Roman Empire rules the world that crucifixion is the means of execution and Jesus comes at the right time, dies the right way in fulfillment of those prophecies. David literally looks down through the halls of history, down through the corridor of time, and a thousand years in the distance sees the Savior suffering and dying and describes it for us in Psalm 22. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. And they nailed Jesus to a cross. To intensify the pain of crucifixion, Roman soldiers attached victims to the cross by driving spikes five to seven inches long through the hands or wrists and feet. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. They divide my garments among them, and cast lots for my clothing. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. That was again typical of Romans. Uh, you strip the guy's clothes off and put him on the cross, and so any of the clothing that was yet considered of any value at all, uh, they would gamble for. Uh, so here are the soldiers gambling at the foot of the cross to see who gets the robe of Jesus, and that's predicted in Psalm 22, a thousand years before the time of Christ, uh, that they have encircled me, uh, that they're taunting me, and in all of that, all of the prophecies, of Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 are fulfilled in minute detail in the death of Jesus Christ. At noon, the sixth hour by Jewish reckoning, the divine judgment of God echoed over Jerusalem through the forces of the natural world. In that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. As the skies darkened and the temperature dropped, Jesus, nearly dead from loss of blood, summoned his last reserve of strength to call out to God as messianic prophecy again came to fruition. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
back in those days, the Psalms were not numbered. And so the way in which you referred to them was to recite the first line. Well, what is Psalm 22? It's a messianic psalm. It has uh, predictions about the coming of the Messiah. And he was, in effect, there on the cross, applying that to himself, saying, Psalm 22 is coming true in me today. My strength is dried up and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. They gave me vinegar for my thirst. Later, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and lifted it up to his lips. After sipping the bitter wine, Jesus uttered his final words again in fulfillment of prophecy. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Thousands of men were crucified, but there was only one man who was God, who was crucified. He was taking the sin that we should have taken upon ourselves, upon himself at that moment, bearing the full sin of the world. At that moment, the earth shook and rocks split. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely, he was the Son of God. I think that we have to look at the Passion of the Christ through the lens of these prophecies. This is more than just a story about someone who comes and dies and claims to be the Son of God and the Messiah. It is a fulfillment of these prophecies against all mathematical odds in a miraculous way that validates the claim of Jesus Christ to be who he claimed to be. God, in a sense, created a fingerprint. He said, I'm going to provide predictions. Whoever fulfills these predictions, you will know he is the Messiah who has come to save Israel and the world. These are very specific uh, details that are given in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament because I think when you see the prophecy and then you see the exact fulfillment in the New Testament it all fits together perfectly Messianic prophecy and New Testament accounts of the passion of Jesus Christ in these sacred texts authored centuries apart prediction and fulfillment have converged to reveal a message for the ages. There is a passage in the Old Testament where God speaks and says, I can declare the end from the beginning. I can predict the future. There is no God like me in all the world. Christianity is the only religion that is based on a hundred prophecies clearly being fulfilled in the life of the founder. It's obvious that these prophecies were intended for us to see the fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why they were given in the first place. For 2,000 years, these prophecies have withstood the critical scrutiny of historians and scholars to forge a compelling case that a carpenter from Nazareth was indeed the promised Messiah. Yet the full significance of these predictions extends beyond Christ's suffering and death. 